But then we started tinkering with the ketone salts and putting ketone salts and mixing that with MCT. So ketone salts alone or mixed with MCT seem to have a, a lot of favorable effects on glycemic regulation, anti-anxiety effects. Uh, you know, they also have an anti-seizure effect, maybe not as strong as the ketone esters, which are just more powerful on a per gram basis. But, uh, but I personally would not, I have access to these things and I, I would not want, even if ketone esters tasted great, I would not be consuming them day in and day out. I don't, just for the same reasons, I don't think it's good to spike glucose throughout the day. I don't think it's, really favorable to throw a lot of energy in the system uh, in a way, especially if ketones get high, you do get a metabolic acidosis that you can, we see pH drop in our animals. So we measure like, you know, our pH levels and blood gases and things like that. And we see that the pH level will drop typically when the ketones get above about three millimolar. So that's probably not a good thing. So I'm of the opinion personally and experimentally by, you know, in the idea of keeping exogenous ketones within like uh, an elevation of one to three millimolar, I think is pretty optimal. Uh, unless you're managing like a very serious form of epilepsy or you have glucose transporter type one deficiency syndrome or some other inborn error metabolism where having higher ketones can be favorable because you have a decrease in other metabolic pathways or transporters, like in the case of glucose transporters deficiency. It sounds like though, you know, so in, for my own personal um, anecdote, when I was trying the ketone esters, you know, at first it was like, oh, maybe more is better. I want to get, you know, three, yeah. at least above three millimolar. And yeah. I was, you know, I got to like 3.5 mm -hmm. with consuming about 30 mils of, I believe the um, one, three, Mm -hmm. by that, yep. that mono uh -huh. yeah that, that formulation and um uh and like, like i said you know 30 mils that's a lot so you know there's people that might be doing that like every couple of hours even and it sounds like mm -hmm. that could potentially be a dangerous thing to do especially if they're getting in that range where there could be a ph change and um if they're not measuring it you know no one's going to know so yeah you know, it's something I don't think we know, and I think it's like if you have like type two diabetes, if you have Alzheimer's disease, if you have you know cancer. I think it's it's better to spread out the dose too. So uh, I think from my perspective, I'd rather take something that's also delivering electrolytes that my body can use, and also that tastes good. And uh, the one three butane diol is also a consideration, right? Because the liver has to work harder. So it uses the alcohol dehydrogenase pathway. And I noticed, you know, playing around with these things over time, just 1,3-butane diol, which the ketone esters, if I consume that at a certain dose for two weeks and then get blood work, my liver enzymes are elevated. They're still within normal range, but they creep up into that upper range of normal, consuming, for example, like one gram per kilogram per day. But that's, that's the amount that's needed to sustain hyperketonemia equivalent to a ketogenic diet. You know, so I notice, I feel intuitively that it's probably better to take a more natural form of ketones where it's just ionically bound to a monovalent or divalent cation like electrolytes, which our body tend to deplete anyway when you're on a state of ketosis. So uh, I use the product uh, Element, LMNT, but in once we got the ketone formulation kind of figured out, uh, you can deliver the same electrolytes that are bound to ketones. So and I think it's a good adjuvant or a good uh, supplement to add to a low carb diet to a ketogenic diet. How often do you, do? is this a daily electrolyte sort of supplemental thing that's? Yeah, okay. yep. and I just use maybe like a small dose in the morning and I combine it with like creatine, acetyl L-carnitine and a couple other like taurine. There's some supplements that I think are really beneficial with the ketogenic diet. They can help boost ketosis. And then when you're on a ketogenic diet, you're oxidizing so much fat, you tend to be deficient in carnitine. And we see this like in kids that are on. So I think carnitine is like really important. Uh, the selenium, some studies may show up that that's really important, but I think that's more of a, the type of foods that you're consuming. I mean, a standard multivitamin too also would be. Yeah. 
multivitamin, but I think you can get a lot of nutrition from, you know, I tend to eat a lot of eggs and sardines and fish and oysters and things like that that are very rich in some things that may be depleted in other people, at least clinically. Um, so I take a little bit of ketone salts in the morning and then later in the day, like midday, as they pick me up, like I'll do the other two thirds of a packet, you know, and I, I feel it. Any other supplements that, um, that you take or that, you know, think are... Uh, yeah, well, I take, you know, from listening to you a lot, the omega-3s, to DHA, EPA, uh, carnitine, because that's really important kind of aspect. If I, if I wasn't taking ketone salts, I would be taking uh, more electrolytes, but I take magnesium. Magnesium, uh, 3 and 8, and also uh, BioOptimizers makes a magnesium breakthrough product, which is like magnesium in like five different forms or six different forms. So I've measured my blood levels of magnesium, and it goes up pretty high uh, with that. And I take vitamin D, uh, which was actually low, even though I get tons of sun, and I was supplementing uh, four to 8,000 IUs a day, and I got a blood test done, and I was on the lower end of normal, which was really confusing. So I got another blood test that, also, that confirmed the other blood test that I was on the low end of normal. So I got prescription vitamin D, which is vitamin D2. And, uh, but then I, I ran out of that and I was using another vitamin D supplement from another maker. I think it was Mind Body Green. I was supplementing with that and then got another vitamin D test after and I stayed elevated in the upper range of normal. So maybe uh, I was using a well-known vitamin D formulation, but it was like from Walgreens or CVS, and I was taking 8,000 IUs a day, and I was still on the low end of normal, even though I'm getting a lot of sun exposure. So this was really probably one of the most weirdest things. Could have been a polymorphism yeah. or, I was thinking about um, that. Yeah. you know, because there are polymorphisms that um, some people uh, require, you know, in some cases two to three times the normal dose to actually yeah. just bring you up to like a, a normal level of like yeah. 30 to 40 nanograms per mil. Yeah. But the other would be that there's been a variety of studies now over the years showing if you take, if you just randomly take different vitamin D supplements off the shelves, like Walgreens, you know, grocery yeah. stores, that the, the actual concentration of vitamin D3 in each supplement varies so widely that mm. you'll often get a supplement that says it's you know 4,000 IU, but it's more like 400 uh -huh. IU. Yeah. And mm -hmm. it's really a big problem, yeah. <laughs> honestly. Um, so it is good to like kind of find some go-to reliable brands. Maybe third-party sites have tested the concentration mm -hmm. of the vitamin D3. I know Labdoor does one, and then um, Consumer Lab, they actually mm -hmm. go around and test the actual concentration of yeah. whatever active ingredient, ingredient, in this case vitamin D3, in a variety of pretty you know readily available um, supplements so yeah. that could be that could have been it as well yeah. right